on. I'm on. Okay. Uh, so we are going to, the next three to four lectures, I haven't decided how many yet. We'll just see how this thing rolls forward. We're going to talk about image analysis. Okay. So primarily the focus will be on images. So we're going to take some data, some kind of picture, essentially, digital picture. And we're going to sort of look at the ways that we can analyze that data. Um, now, the nice thing about image analysis, it's that it's a very graphically driven way of looking to see how you're doing in terms when it comes to interpreting things, right? So th there's something very nice about this. But one shouldn't think about this as just being something that's for, you know, cleaning up pictures or things like this. Uh, one way you can think about what we do is really more related to, I have data sets, two-dimensional data sets. I often uh, represent them in some way and try to picture what the data is telling me. Well, this also allows you to sort of clean up your uh, data that you've taken experimentally. So for instance, you have temperature variations across the ocean. You might plot a picture of that and start trying to figure out what does that look like. There's a lot of noise. How can I denoise this thing? Try to clean it up a little bit so that I can construct a more meaningful um, viewpoint to analyze that, OK? Most of the data you're going to have is always going to be, you're always going to plot it, right? I mean, ultimately, nobody's going to just take data and just look at big matrices. Oh, yeah, I see what's going on. You're going to plot this thing somehow. And from plotting that, uh, you're going to try to figure out and analyze what's going on in that, OK? So, Let's talk about some of the uh, image analysis that people are very interested in. And again, this relates to not only pictures, uh, but obviously that's one. Digital photos, you don't want to, you know, touch yourself up, get rid of that little red, you know, red eye and maybe, you know, slim yourself down. Whatever you need to do in that digital image processing, you can do it. You can have the skills. <coughs> uh, but more generally, there are things like ultrasound. Ultrasound is producing, again, images of, uh, for <clears throat> those of us with kids, right, this was huge, ultrasound. You know when they come and they put the gel on, they look inside the stomach, oh, everything looks good, that's what you want to hear. <laughs> you know, it's a nerve-wracking experience, actually. But, you know, you want to get good image resolution, try to figure out what your baby looks like. Uh, this also is a nice way to image just if you're having problems in areas, ultrasound is a really nice non-invasive way of trying to figure things out uh, in your body. Uh, there's infrared or thermal images, thermal imaging. Okay, so you're going to take, uh, for instance, night vision devices of some sort or another very nice for uh, producing, essentially, changing the infrared field into sort of an optical field, right? So you can actually still see things almost as if it's daylight. Uh, tomography. So this is typically you would produce, uh, let's say, CAT scans, for instance. This is, again, another med medical imaging device that uh, people are familiar with. MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. Okay, basically you take someone and put them in this big tube, apply a strong magnetic field, align all the uh, electrons in the, hit, uh, or in the body, and then you hit it with a FM, RF signal, boom, and you watch what comes out on certain planes, and you can image a body. Okay pretty important for a lot of medical applications. Uh, actually, you'll see that a lot of imaging uh, technologies are directly related to the medical field, right? So this is a way of trying to figure out what's wrong with you or your, I remember in homework two even, figure out that marble in your dog's stomach, right? Through, through sort of uh, ultimately some kind of imaging technology. Uh, radar. We also know about radar, and we also think about computer graphics. So these are all the kind of areas where people have an intrinsic interest 
in image analysis. So in other words, <coughs> there's this idea that we know that images are important. But more than that, what we're typically going to get is perhaps image quality or experimental data that is not ideal. Right? Lots of noise in it. Perhaps we need to really get good feature detection, cleaning up edges. We really need to get as much information out of the data that we have as possible, whether that be in a digital photo or any of these other applications. Okay? So part of what we want to do is talk about the kinds of things that we go on in images. And then we're going to talk about using mathematical ideas to come up with solutions to handle these things. Okay? That's, that's it. That's the basic premise. So let's talk about the kinds of things uh, that we might, might want to do. OK. Image contrast enhancement. OK. Contrast is typically related to the fact that seeing the differences between, let's say, different objects in a picture. Okay? Uh, if you don't have a whole lot of contrast, then it's really hard to tell where one object might end, another one begins, and so forth. So uh, for instance, this is very important in ultrasound, maybe where you're going through soft tissue whose properties don't change significantly. So you want something that's very sensitive to where you do get changes in the material. Okay, that's really the critical thing. Uh, from a digital photography point of view, this is where you're taking a picture of something in low light and everything's kind of really dark. Okay, but you'd still like to extract out the key features of the photo. Um, so ultimately, in some sense, it's related to edge detection. And I put it all in caps because we're also on edge. <laughs> awesome. See the tie-in? Anyway, there we go. Edge detection. That's what we want to do. You give me an image, can I spot an edge in it? By spotting edges, I can enhance that edge okay, to give better contrast. So that's the main idea here. Okay? We'll, we'll talk about this. So edge detection, key, key issue to think about. And again, this is going to be, for instance, in medical imaging, you want to pick up very cleanly as much as possible where edges exist. Uh, if you haven't noticed, by the way, uh, let me put this here. It's built in. So uh, if you have some software, like uh, if you're on a Mac like I am, there is the iPhoto. In iPhoto, you can push on a button and say, do I want to edit my images? Yes. And then there's an Enhance button down there. And basically what it does is it does image contrast enhancement. Okay? So some of the, a lot of photo uh, stuff that you have on your computer already has some of the stuff all built in. Little pieces of code that just say, okay, let's enhance the image. Let's get better contrast. Boom, boom, boom. All that stuff's there. Right? There's all this processing, digital image processing, that you've probably already been using. And it's just built into your, uh, a lot of software. Okay, so we'll talk about some of the mathematics behind that, potentially. So image contrast enhancement. That's one thing you might want to do. Another thing you might want to do, image denoising. Okay. Now, image denoising, uh, we're going to make some noisy images here in just a moment. This is particularly important for the biological, biological imaging processes. So when we come over here to this image analysis and we think about our digital photos, typically we don't get a lot of noise in our pictures. What we do get a lot of is potentially low contrast because we don't have good lighting. Potentially, we shook the camera. We get blurring. So that's a different issue. Deblurring is different from denoising. And blurring comes in the fact that you might be out of focus or you've 
Every time you take the picture, you do a little shaking of the camera. Amazingly enough, there are techniques to remove de <laughs> your shaking of the camera. Post-process this thing, remove out what you, you're shaking, okay? Um, but the noise comes in a lot in these kind of things here, which is when you pick this up, every time you do it, there's movement of fluids, there's movement of a person. You're trying to get very accurate resolution down onto centimeter, millimeter, micron scale. Someone moves, breathes, whatever. You, you start you know, moving your stuff around. You get a lot of noise in your images there. So essentially, in the imaging process, there's a couple ways to think about it. You could also, by the way, get noise in an image if you have a corrupt digital image, for instance. You say, take a file, and it was corrupted somehow, so I, ha I don't have the full uh, resolution that I had at some point. But the idea is that, it's, that your image is something like this. Here's your image that you have. Here is the, let's say, the perfect image. And here is some additive noise. Let's say additive Gaussian noise. So you can think about your signal as being some combination of there's a, really, a true picture there, but I've got all this noise on it. And I'd like to figure out ways to remove that. Okay? So that's, that's the objective. Is take this out to get as close to this as possible. Uh, by the way, this is one type of noise. Another type of noise, this is uh, Gaussian noise, is, I'll explain this more as we go along. This is called salt and pepper noise. So S and C a binary random variables taken on a value of 0 of 1. So the idea is going to be that basically I'm going to decide at every single point and location whether in fact I have this to be 0 or 1. Okay? In other words, if it's 0, then I just get back pure clean signal. And if that's 0, pure clean signal. Right? So F, S is 0 gives me back, oh, at this point I have at some pixel, I have the image. However, if S is 1, then this becomes 1 minus 1, cancels out. I have C of X, and C of X is going to be some, let's say, binary noise as well. So at every position there where I have this thing being 1, I'm going to either have a black spot or a white spot. Thus, the name salt and pepper. Okay. All right, so it's a different type of noise. By the way, this is a nonlinear noise. This is not here where this is just a linear addition to the noise. This is a little bit more complicated and convoluted. A lot of decisions about how good a denoising process is is not based upon, hey, how well did I take off that? It's about how well can I remove something like salt and pepper noise because that, in fact, is not sort of a, a nice linear process. Okay. It's still just noise, but there you go. You have your signal, it's measured. How do I extract back out the pure signal as best as possible, U of X? In both cases, this is all you want to do. Okay, so you denoise an image. Okay. So we've got two things down. Contrast enhancement, denoising. Deblurring. So what does deblurring do? Well, effectively, blurring is caused by two effects primarily. One is camera shake. The other is out of focus. All right, so let's talk about severe camera shake, i.e., my mom. Okay, my mom, every time she takes a picture, you ask her, Mom, can you take a picture of us? You give her the camera. And then afterwards, you get your photos back, or you go look at your digital camera afterwards. And I'm always pictured from the neck down. 
And she's always said she doesn't like my nose so much, my ears, she would, anyway. So maybe that's why it happens. But it's usually she comes to take it and she pushes the button down. She hasn't quite figured out that when she does this, she would have chopped everybody's heads off. So nice thing about my girls, they're seven and four, you know, they're in the picture just fine. Daddy's cut out, wife is uh, top of her hair's off. But that's uh, camera shake, well, severe camera shake. Maybe that's even called, I don't know what you want to call that. But uh, most people are a little bit less prone to such large variations in their camera shake, and they just do a little camera shake. In fact, they say this is becoming a, a larger and larger problem for digital cameras because of one specific reason. These cameras are so light, so portable, that your ability to actually hold them steady, it goes down. A heavy camera gives you something a little bit more stable to uh, not have such camera shake on. Uh, but I, right now, actually, you can buy uh, anti-shake devices on your camera. Basically, what they are are algorithms to remove your shaking of the hand okay, and clean up the image. We're going to talk a little bit about it. In fact, that might be one of these projects that if someone's interested in for a final project here. There's just an algorithm you can apply. Take an image, run it through MATLAB, it removes your handshake. The handshake itself produces a very characteristic signature in the spectral domain. And by producing a characteristic signature, you can say, OK, I know what shaking produces. I will undo it. So that's one way to, that's one thing that de-blurs. Second one is just you're out of focus, right? You just, the, the lens is, you know, the autofocus. Maybe it focuses on the background instead of the thing you're looking at. So you have your focal length is either too short, too long. There are ways also to clean that up, okay? So that is an application you might want to do, uh, and there are algorithms to take care of it. It's pretty remarkable, really. In fact, the deblurring, this camera shake, removing camera shake, I think it's just it's, it's fantastic. I, I, I imagine it will be just a matter of a few years before you can apply this algorithm, like you have iPhoto on Mac, and you'll just say deblur, push it, and it will try to do this algorithm to remove camera shake for you. Uh, right away. So I, I don't think it'll be that long until this is actually just part of a bunch of commercial software packages. Okay. Uh, in painting, you have some picture. We're going to go with the Northwest scene here. Here you go, a mountain with sunshine. There's a bunch of people with fleece hiking around here somewhere, I'm sure. Okay, and somehow, through some mechanism, some of the file becomes corrupt. So all of a sudden, you're missing whole segments of the picture where there's no data. Question is, could you fill in those spots in some algorithmic way to so impaint what's missing? Okay, so. Uh, your first thought might be something like, hey, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, let's put one right here, by the way. What I can do is I can interpolate just with the values you, around it, right? You could just say, why don't I just take an average of the points around it? Well, that's the simplest thing you could think about doing. However, part of what you're trying to do is do all these kind of other things with this, which is suppose I'm right there where that missing stuff is right on a mountain edge. There's a edge detection that should run right through there. Can I come up with more sophisticated ways to put in the in-painting so that, in fact, maybe I can even say, oh, look at that. That line might continue to here, so why don't I somehow use that fact to in-paint part of the image? Because if you just took an average value of all the values around here, it would look terrible. But if you kind of take into account the kind of edge detection features you have, in addition to all the other kind of stuff going around, you might come up with some very good algorithms to paint missing data. Okay, so that's a that's a really uh, good one to think about as well. In painting, there's algorithms to do this. Um, final thing to think about in image processing. Uh, Segmentation. And 
More generally, okay, so this is related partly to the image contrast, um, but segmentation or edge detection. So in some cases, suppose I'm looking at a ultrasound of your body. I'm trying to see, for instance, uh, maybe there's a mass in there that's not supposed to be in there. And I have low contrast. And all I care about is I don't really care of having a good image. All I care about is having an outline that's pretty clear of what this thing is. Okay, so segmentation is going to say, okay, I'm going to divide up this domain into pieces. In, out. I'm that thing or not. And so all I care about is not producing a nice image. That's what this is. This is trying to clean up your image, make it a little bit nicer, more pleasing to the eye in some sense. This one's not. This is just saying, all I care about is where that edge sits. I'm just going to give you that edge information. That's it. Okay? And that might be the application you're looking for. Uh, this kind of thing, this edge detection, again, very important in terms of the biomedical fields. You could say in many ways the imaging technology is really being driven largely, at least the high-end stuff, by the medical technologies. There's all kinds of conferences just devoted to biomedical imaging. Okay? And uh, they care a lot about this stuff. Okay, so with each one of these ideas comes a mathematical technique associated with it to try to figure out how to do any one of these five things. Okay, so part of our, uh, part of what we want to work on in this week, uh, by the way, we're going to talk about image analysis formally this week, but we will come back to it often throughout the rest of the quarter. Uh, the plan is to switch over uh, next week to linear algebra and principal component analysis, or SVD, singular value decompositions. Introduce that concept, bring that to bear. And then after that, we're going to start bringing in the linear algebra with the spectral time frequency analysis, statistical analysis all together. And some of the platforms where this works beautifully is image analysis. Okay? So just, we'll start it here but it will continue later. All right, so let's talk about some methods. The key methods. Uh, let me see how many. The five key mathematical methods that are used to produce these kind of image enhancement, quality enhancement type things, okay? All right. So one of the first things to do is take what's called a morphological approach to the image. The whole point of this method actually addresses the segmentation and contrast issue, which is all it tries to do is you take, give me a 2D space, and you take this and all your 2D objects, you're looking for 2D objects in this space, are sets or domains of the 2D plane. That's the whole idea. You're going to take an image, and you're going to break it down into sets. There's a rectangle. There's a circle. There is a square. There's some complicated polygon. Fine. All I care about is, are you in that set or out of that set? It's a binary kind of evaluation about sets. Okay. So, uh, so really. Issues here, edge detection. All right, so let me, let me draw a basic picture of what this might 
look like. All right, so here's a photo. Uh, trip to DC. I was on the mall. There's the Washington Monument. How do you guys like my photos? Is that nice? Super nice. OK. Actually, let's not put these. That, that's the sun. But you know, those action lines tell you that the sun is shining. OK. All right. So you know, something like this might de be decomposed into certain sets. So for instance, there would be a ball. That would be one set. There would be something like that would be another set. There would be this structure there. These trees, not sure what that would look like. Maybe they're just balls. The point is, what it tries to do is put it down into some very simple sets. That's the first pass of representing that image. In some sense, by the way, it's a lot like a multi-resolution analysis, except that you're just doing level one. What are the big features here? Boom. Okay. It's a minimalist. If you're thinking about it in terms of art, it's a minimalist representation. So awesome. Okay. There it is. And you could put that up in an art show, charge a million dollars for it. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do right after class. I'm going to take a picture of you guys and represent you as minimalist objects. Sell it to the Burke. All right. So that's the idea. All right. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that, edge detection issues. But fine, for now, at least you have the concept. That's going to be it. Just construct everything in terms of sets. Method number two. This gets us back on more familiar ground. was recognized very early on that you give me a signal, you give me a picture, I can do, break it down to Fourier components, right? Just a bunch of frequencies and kx, ky. I can represent the image in terms of its Fourier transform instead. So you decompose into the frequency contents. Jeez, it's horrible writing. <laughs> Okay. Now, one of the beautiful things about Fourier transforms and putting it into the Fourier basis, as you'll see here, I'm going to do a little example, is that when you decompose it, most of the energy of the photo sits in a clustering of Fourier components, which we'll see in a moment, which means this gave the first idea that you could say, well, look, if I just kind of throw away all the stuff that doesn't have much much energy in it, throw away all, I could have a very sparse representation of the image. I throw in the Fourier domain. It's not, okay, let's talk about an image here. Let's say I have some stuff. Okay, let's go back to our <laughs> picture. Shouldn't have erased it. Okay, and I could say, let's take Fourier transform of that image. And it might look like, I'll show you a picture of it. Anyway, it might look something like this. It's mostly zeros, except for key elements and some lines. Now, in this photo, if I were to say, hey, I don't need all those pixels. I'll just remove out a bunch of the stuff. You can't really do that, right? I mean, you can't throw away x and y position. Otherwise, you're going to have in-painting problem, because in this space domain, you need the full image. However, here, I could say, well, this is almost all zeros here. Almost all zeros here, 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 here. Out here. I'll just throw all that away. Represent the image just by, you will have a certain amount of energy in it. I'll keep that point, everything else gone. This is image compression. Okay? So image compression with FFTs was the first thing that people did. Earliest JPEG versions, right there. Okay? So this is the idea. You do this, you throw a bunch of components away, you get JPEG compression. Done. Okay? That was, by the way, 1980s. So, cool thing about the wedding this weekend I went to, Saturday. 
you know, everybody was about my age. So they're playing a bunch of 80s music. It's awesome. You know, they start off with some Journey and some Bon Jovi. But, you know, uh, anyway, we all, uh, we all appreciated it. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Here's the thing about Journey, by the way. Uh, don't stop believing. You know, uh, I went once out, my, my graduate student defended his PhD, Brandon. We went out to karaoke. Anyway, they're all singing these random songs. And then all of a sudden, about 12.30 at night, on comes Don't Stop Believing. They start playing. I go, nobody's going to know this except for like me and a couple other people. All these 20-year-olds are belting it out. I'm like, OK, how'd they learn that? Because they weren't born. I was. But they weren't born yet, and they, they all knew Journey, Don't Stop Believing. So there you go. It's the new Shook Me All Night Long. Just throw it out there. OK. There's Fourier analysis. Put that on the, one of the songs you have to know, by the way, before you graduate with your PhD, Edwin. OK. <laughs> Wavelets. Been talking about them a lot. Obviously, soon you talk about Fourier analysis. There's a little bit of an issue here, which you could say, wavelets are kind of the younger cousin. You say, anything you can do, I can do better. There's a little bit of that um, issue going on with wavelets. And kind of it's sort of true. Okay? Except for it, wavelets are a little bit more difficult to work with. But you give up some, you know, some difficulty for actually how powerful they are. Uh, so wavelets, again, you can decompose into frequency content. And here's the beauty of wavelets. The Fourier transform, stuff like this, step functions, what are they? What is it? Well, step function produces something that's very broad in the frequency domain. And k is like 1 over omega. So for instance, most photos have a lot of edges in them. So let's come back over to here. If we look at the edges, the edges produce huge frequency content. Okay, Because they're like step functions. Step functions decay very slowly. Okay, But what we know about wavelets, the whole reason we constructed them, is that wavelets can localize both in time and in frequency, or in space and frequency. Okay? So wavelets overcome some of the slow decay. And so with a very much smaller set of wave numbers, essentially, the wavelet expansion, you can actually represent quite a bit more data. And here, the idea, the wavelet representation, is you can project a signal onto a wavelet basis. Okay? So you, this is just the inner product. Remember, we do an expansion of the wavelets. And all we cared about were the wavelet coefficients, just like Fourier analysis. When you expand in the, in the Fourier domain, you just, all you care about are the, um, uh, the strength of each Fourier coefficient. This is the equivalent here, but it's the wavelet coefficients. Once you have that, it tells you everything you need to know about the image. And the whole point is, with wavelets, you can use a lot fewer coefficients to represent your signal than the Fourier. So about the 1980s, this took over. This is what you do image compression with. And it's all due to the fact that the Fourier transform can't handle that very well, essentially. Discontinuities. And that's what most images have. You have sharp edges. Fourier transform can still do an OK job. Wavelet does a great job. OK. So wavelets become important for image. Images, a uh, couple other things you can do. Yes. Uh huh. So, if wavelets are a combination of the frequency and whatever space domain, yeah. then um, I can understand throwing away Fourier components because we know what they are and we can be sort of assured that we don't need that in our data, but throwing away wavelets, I don't, you don't quite know what you're... Right, so your evaluation now comes to be how big is this, the C alpha. Here, it's really easy to say. You just plot this thing, you have a very intuitive understanding of what you're throwing away. Right, so you can just say, hey, anything that's super small, gone. 
Here, when you do a full decomposition of the signal, you're going to do it more of an algorithmic way. You don't have necessarily the intuitive part where you just plot the thing. Oh, look, I can throw this away, and that means that. Here, you're going to say, look, you know, what are the, what are the sizes of C of alpha? Suppose they range from 0 to 1. And I can say, you know what, anything below 10 to minus 6, done. And so you throw away all those wavelets, and you keep everything else that is above a certain level, and that's how you think about storing your information. You can then replot this. In fact, if you remember from Friday's lecture, I did a decomposition of an image into two levels. And over that two level wavelet expansion, you actually saw the reconstruction of the image after two wavelet. So there, you have to actually look at the reconstructed image. It doesn't make sense to look at it in the, for, in the wavelet domain in some sense. Yeah, but that's the idea. All right, there's some other stuff. But we got to go to the computer. OK, so uh, let me turn on the projector. So now what we're going to do is the following. We're going to just, just show you a little bit of this image stuff so we can start talking a little bit more hands-on about what we want to do. The one thing I will mention, a mathematical technique for denoising using the idea of diffusion. Diffusion equations, like this one here, you give me a very rough initial data. And you say, I want to evolve according to this diffusion equation. It smooths things out instantly. Why can't we use that same concept here? Treat your image as a set of collection of data and just say, OK, I want to get rid of noise, for instance. Noise creates all this choppiness. All I have to do is take my picture, diffuse it a little bit. I don't have to diffuse it very much. All I want to do is smooth it. I want to just smooth it slightly and then reconstruct the image. Essentially, what this is going to do is take out the noise. It's like filtering, but not like filtering. Okay. Here's why. When you do filtering, you've got to put a filter somewhere. Everything outside of that filter is going to get killed. This doesn't kill everything outside the filter. This just says, I'm going to take a little bit from everybody, kill you off a little bit, okay? but not very much. If you put a filter, you just eliminate everybody from here to here. But maybe my signal actually has some stuff out there that I really need good resolution on. I don't know that ahead of time. I don't know to put a filter here, and then here, and here, and here. The diffusion just says, let's do all of this, smooth it all out, and see what happens. We're going to do that. That is the simplest diffusing process you can do. It cleans up your data beautifully, and it makes a lot of mathematical sense. OK. So let's get this thing up here. Whoa. OK. OK. All right. So. All I can say before I start showing these images is just to control yourself. This is it, if I, if I can be so bold. All right. So let's come over here. And here's what I'm going to do. We'll do some in image analysis. First of all, I've got to have a, an image. So we're going to produce an image. A is equal to I am read. The I am read command is image read. So I can basically import a photo. Let's call it photo. And it has a TIFF format. What does this do? Well, it goes out. There's a file called photo.tiff. And it loads it in. It reads it in as an image. Okay. If it's a, you can have different specification here. It's JPEG, GIF, you know, all the different things that MATLAB reads. You just put the file format and the name of the file. OK, so there we have it. I've just loaded in the image. Now let's take a, a, look, at this, a look at this image that we got here. OK, like I said, control yourself. Uh, all you have to do is say, actually, image A. That's equivalent to the pot, plot, not the pot command, the plot command.
Oh, I have to do, hold on. Sorry, let's try that. There, there's our image. A beautiful cappuccino, that's right, made in my office. Yes, I had one just before class. I want another. See that little beautiful design? Anyway, I just picked this image because, you know, I just, I like it. Uh, and that's our image. It's a TIFF image, loaded in. By the way, how does it come in? This is a color image, right? Showing off this beautiful Italian mug. Uh, this image that comes in always comes in as, first of all, a set of pixels. You can see it here. It's 800 by 600 pixels for every pixel. There are three data values for the RGB cube determining the color, okay? So if we want to check out this data cube, we can say, okay, what's the uh, size of A? And if we do that, then we can look over here. It's 600 by 800 by 3, okay? It's a cube of data, and that piece there tells us the color specifications of every single point. Okay. Now, let me show you some other things that you have to know about working with this data. I'm going to add noise to it. Now, you may think that is such a shame to add such noise to such a beautiful cup of coffee. But don't worry. We're just adding noise now so we can denoise it later. All right. Uh, so how would you add noise to it? It's a 600 by 800 by 3. And so what I can do is say, I'm going to, add, I'm going to make a noise uh, matrix, call it rand n, right? Normally distributed random variables. That's 600 by 800 by 3. And what I'm going to do is make a noisy signal. It's called a n. And I'm just going to add the a plus the noise. Now, let's try this. If I run it, plots here. Boom, I get an error. Error. Integers can only combine with integers of the same class or scalar doubles. What's going on with that? Now, if I look over here, here, when you read in a figure, here's the type it is. A is a 600 by 800 by 3, but it's a little deceiving, okay, because it's, a, it's a basically an integer class, okay? So when you read in images, JPEGs, TIFFs, whatever, it's not coming in as double precision numbers. You have to convert them. And if you wanted to use the image commands, you have to convert them back to UNT8. There's UNT16. There's, so you're starting to get in when you start doing image processing. You have to understand the class that you're working with, how this stuff is actually stored. The noise is itself a double. This is not a double. So we can make it a double. In fact, this drink was a double. Uh, let's bring that back over here just by saying double. There. Now, when I do it, you'll see no error. Nobody's complaining. So that means it did it. Now what we want to do, uh, and also add what kind of noise strength I want. Let's put in about... Um, the noise, what we don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but let's just go ahead and do this. So what we're going to do is do a subplot, 2, 2, 1, image A. Now I've got this uh, noise piece that I want to do, and let's make this subplot, 2, 2, 2. What I want to plot now is uh, the image of this thing, but I have to convert it back. Okay, so let's call it uh, A2, which will be... U int 8, I'm turn, I'm going to, of an. Okay? So I just converted it back. Now I can do image A2. There we go. Okay, so you see what I did? I went, I took my image, I tickled the color cube, I tickled everything, I, I, I put noise all over that thing. And you can still see most of the features, but it's clearly uh, deteriorated its image quality, right? I've added all this Gaussian noise to it. This is the simplest thing. So I mean, part of our objective, just like when we started talking about radar, is to say, this is what you're given. How do I get 
close to this again. Okay, this is the perfect. You can, if I try to get out the noise of this thing, I denoised it. The best I could do is reproduce this exactly. Okay, so that's the ideal. And the question is, how close to that can I get? Okay, but that's a, that's the noisy image that I have. Okay, what we really want to work with, though, since we're in MATLAB, is we want to actually take data, a matrix, and do stuff with it. Right now, this thing is a cube. So what does it mean to work with three slices of colors on this cube? So we're going to just do something simple, do black and white for now. Okay. So black and white gives us then, it's going to remove that third cube dimension. It's just going to give us a cube uh, of data that has no longer the RGB associated with it. So let's make an image. A, black and white, is going to be, you take an RGB to gray. So what this does is it takes this, matrix, this A field, Right, which is the image, raw image, 600 by 800 by 3. And what it's going to do, it's going to take away the RGB cube and turn it into a grayscale. Okay, so ABW will still be U int 8 format, but now this three color RGB cube gets averaged in a very specific way to make grayscale. All right, so then we can plot this, subplot 2, 2, 3. Oh, by the way, let's also put here the size of ABW because you want to see what it looks like. Oops. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hold on one second here. Um, hmm. Oh, I am show. There we go. There you go. I made myself a little black and white cup of coffee. Okay. Uh, by the way, what I do want to do now, and this is important, is you see what it looks like with noise. The one thing I also want to do is show you what does the Fourier transform of that image look like. The interesting thing is the reason I wanted to get it down from here to here is this is a 600 by 800 by 3. This is now just 600 by 800. And if I double that, now it is a true data file, and I can just FFT it and look at its Fourier content. Okay? So let's do that. Let's, let's go ahead and FFT this thing, and I can p-color it. I can start doing all the commands I have in MATLAB. So here's going to be the deal, figure 2. What I'm going to do is call this the, uh, let's call it B, is going to be the double of ABW. Okay, and by the way, we saw that AWB right here at 600 by 800. So as advertised, we've taken out that third dimension. Okay, so now it's a double, and now I can say just simply its Fourier transform will be the FFT2 of B. And what I want to do is go ahead and FFT shift that to plot it. And then I also want to just take its absolute value. Boom. And then what I want to do is the following. P color, B, 2, 2, 1. I want to P color, B. And I'm going to make a color map. We'll do the hot color map. Then we'll do subplot 2, 2, 2, 2. And we'll p color. Now, I'm going, to color, I'm going to plot the log of BT. You'll see why in a moment. So that's what I'm going to do. I take this image, clean it up, FFT it, plot it. Let me just show you what this looks like. I need a, hold on, give me, sorry, sorry, uh, oh, I missed shading, oh, 
Okay, that would be good to spell that wrong. Shay Dung. <laughs> yeah. I spelled logged. Oh, lot is not, it's not a command in MATLAB, you're telling me? <laughs> there. All right, so timing isn't so bad uh, to finish, but there you go. So here's what you get. Here's this image. I'm not it's turned upside down because now it's going, it's counting differently than the, the image command does. It goes from 1 to 600 versus the other way around. It's on a hot color map, but I can just make it grayscale, whatever. You take its Fourier transform, that's what it looks like. You could see I have some key characteristics directions. And by the way, what do these correspond to? Well, these correspond mostly to things that are going horizontal, vertical direction. That's your biggest signature, typically. I have some circular stuff in here that's going to give me a big spread of energy around here. Let me try to zoom in real quick to show you one other feature. You can't quite see it, but we'll see if you can see it better with this. Can you see these lines right here? Is these lines here? Essentially, what the Fourier transform picks up is that kind of line corresponds to lines in your See this edge here, here, these slope lines? They get picked up in the Fourier domain this way. Okay? But the important thing to notice about this image, how sparse is this? It's very sparse. Right? I mean, look, there's hardly anything out here, 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 here. I could almost throw away um, you know, 80% of the data and still probably reproduce this very nicely. How you throw it away gives you the JPEG image compression factor. Do you want good resolution, bad? It always asks you that oftentimes when you save. That's a question that's directly related to how much do you want me to come in here and chop stuff off? Okay. So, but otherwise you can see there's very specific character signatures there. All right, we'll stop with that. We'll continue next time. <laughs>